evening with Green and Shy's Fireside Chat from our headquarters at Workbox here, 420 North Wabash. Tonight we have some really good guests for you. Uh, we have two of the co-founders of Supercritical, Mr. Sparky Rose and Terry Jordan. Both of them have an extensive background in this field. Very unique stories from where they came up. I mean, uh, Carrie started off in the beginning of electronic trading with NASDAQ, also advisory on some great hedge funds and working her way through now in the cannabis industry, providing a lot. And, you know, Sparky, he has you know, some of the, the best stories I've ever heard starting back <laughs> in the beginning of the cannabis industry back in 2003, 2006 period, where all the really cool behind the scenes things happened. So, you know, we're going to have a, a very interesting talk, turning the gears a little bit more on the business side, talking about capital raising, banking, the do's, the don'ts, what you should do so you can get funding, financing, or the correct banking to do cannabis the right way and survive. And right now, you know, if this is the first time you're joining us, Green and Shy is a platform designed to bring opportunity. Opportunity for those that want to learn about cannabis in the CBD market, uh, gain education so they can get jobs and careers, start a business and get the tools that you need so that you can grow or even grow your business as well as invest into them. So tonight, you know, we have a very good group and it's people like this that, you know, sharing their knowledge, their expertise that help us all grow as a cannabis community. So I'll start off by ladies first, Miss Carrie Jordan. What got you into this business? I mean, you had an extensive background in this trading, in the hedge fund community, and now cannabis flops up on your map. What got you into it? What was the aha moment that, you know, really got you interested in this industry? I've been a lifelong fan of Bob Marley, and he's always been my inspiration whenever I've had challenges to overcome, whenever I've needed inspiration. So I've always been involved to that extent with cannabis because it was such a part of his life and then a number of years ago when i was thinking about where i wanted to move my career next and saw how much cannabis was changing and how that landscape was becoming much more prevalent in everyday life i thought it would be a really good combination of combining my professional and academic background with my passion for the peace and love and unity message of Bob Marley. So really, you know, taking it from both the philosophical side as well as the business side. And it's uh, really a lot, a lot of people are into. And, you know, Sparky, I know on your side of the industry, I mean, what kind of experience haven't you had in the, in the cannabis? <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure you've seen things evolve. I mean, just in the last, uh, what, now, I keep on thinking it's March with all this pandemic that's already June, but, you know, it's only been around for six months, but here in Illinois, it went from being something that was criminal to essential. You, starting back off in, you know, 2003, uh, even earlier, you know, what kind of things got you into it back then, and why are you so passionate about it right now? Uh, the things that got me, got me into it back then were a, a very odd uh, matter of circumstance. Um, Let's see. Uh, I was in California. Uh, I've, I've, my career is mostly in brand marketing, visual design and brand marketing. And um, I was working for a large staffing company out there running their e-business initiatives uh, when the internet bubble uh, burst. And so I left that job and uh, started a small art gallery in San Francisco. Uh, it was a contemporary jewelry and metal arts. And uh, it was doing really good for a few months. And then September 11th hit and no one was buying luxury goods. So I had to go find a, a new job. And so while I was looking for a job, no one was hiring internet strategists at the time because the internet bubble had just burst. So uh, instead of going stir crazy at the house, I decided to join a punk rock band, as you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been playing the drums since I was about four years old. And to get out of the house, I figured I'll you know, go play in a band. And my bass player had lupus. And he heard me complaining about the job market. You know, you send out resumes, nobody ever gets back to you and just kind of going stir crazy. And he said, hey, you know, it doesn't pay a whole lot of money, but if you want to get out of the house, I work at a cannabis club and I can get you a job standing behind the counter selling weed. And I had heard of cannabis clubs at the time. That's what dispensaries are called traditionally in California, but I'd never been in one and I figured it'd be fun, you know, to give it a try and I'll do it for a few weeks till I got my next job. Uh, eight weeks later, I was the executive director of Compassionate Caregivers. Uh, we won one of the first four 
dispensary licenses ever issued in the United States of America and Oakland, California. And then, you know, the rest is, is kind of history. You know, I grew compassionate to seven dispensaries, three cultivation centers. We were doing about $5 million a month in revenue. I got busted by the feds, uh, went to federal prison for three years, got out about 10 years ago, uh, came uh, out to Chicago about nine years ago. I had a year that I had to stay in LA under the terms of my supervised release. And when I got to Chicago, I was back into brand marketing. I was working at Ogilvy and Mather. And then through my wife, met someone who was helping folks here get their um, applications done for the uh, medicinal marijuana pilot program. And I helped her out and she wanted to launch a product line. So we launched a topical company called Sacred, which is now a CBD company with national distribution. After that, I helped launch uh, Papa and Barkley, number one topical company in California. After that, I was uh, chief marketing officer at Pharmacan here in Illinois, launched Matter and redesigned their uh, dispensaries, the Vera Life dispensaries. And then uh, after that, launched 4042 North, which is a cannabis brand marketing firm here in Illinois. And then last October, I met uh, Carrie and our other partner, Jay, and we started Supercritical. Um, so that's how I got in uh, to it. And uh, I, I absolutely love the industry. Um, obviously, I went to prison and I came back. Uh, if I get arrested <laughs> again, I'm in a lot, a lot, a lot of deep trouble. Um, <clears throat> but provided none of that happens. Uh, the reason I'm into it really is uh, it, partially because of my prison experience, um, you know, uh, I went into prison, uh, minimum security prison for three years in, in a place called Lompoc, uh, California, in, in uh, San Luis Obispo. And, uh, you know, when you think about minimum security federal prison, which is where you're going to go if you have a short sentence like I did, you know, it's, it's club fed and, and there's um, typically uh, white collar criminals, you know, uh, people who do bank fraud and that sort of thing. And, and it's just not true. 80% uh, of the inmates in minimum security prison are black and brown individuals in on drugs. And I've been fortunate enough to have been an entrepreneur my entire life. So when I got out of prison, I called some friends. I got some, you know, design work to get the cash flow going. And then I kind of got back into the swing of things, the designer, and then, uh, you know, back into advertising. Um, and it was fairly easy for me um, to do that as a freelancer. A lot of my very, very good friends are laborers uh, from prison. And they have to check the box that says I'm a convicted felon on every application they fill out for the rest of their lives. That is fundamentally wrong. You've paid your debt to society. This is the gift, the felony around your neck is a gift that keeps on giving. And that's what, that's what I'm driving for. I'm trying to end the drug war. I'm trying to you know, right the wrongs that have been um, thrust upon so many for a really, really silly uh, drug war. And so that's really my motivation. Absolutely, and that's a great story. And you know, it kind of brings up a good point because cannabis, there's no other industry, I guess, that you can mark that down or people are looking for that type of background to get preferential treatment in some of these applications because it's included in there. You know, there's a lot of different aspects that now in other industries might be taboo, but it's very embraced here. And, you know, the stories that you have from that experience, only, you know, one or a few people can probably have something similar to that. And, you know, that knowledge is very valuable. And, you know, you said something very interesting through those stories, the word launch, launch, you launched everything. And, in my mind, you know, that's, that's a good place to start with this conversation because you can't, la you can't launch shit if you don't have funding for it or you don't have the backing for it or the financing for it. So how did that change from 2003 to what you're working with now as an advisor and, and your clients that you guys are advising for critical because, you know, it seemed like something before that only the people that were into it would invest. There's a lot of risk to it. People that saw the cash flow might have a now there's a lot of people getting into it and it's more about, you know, the process to follow and who to know. So what are your, what, what's your take on that? It's still so, really, really yeah. difficult to get funding. It's incredibly difficult. And especially for women and minorities, it's mm -hmm. very much an industry where those that historically have had the money and power continue to have the money and power. And that's one of the things that we at Supercritical want to change. We want to have all access to capital and we work really hard for our entrepreneurs as well as for investors to get them opportunities where they can make a difference and we can have diverse funding sources and we can have diverse entrepreneurs to connect with our investors. Absolutely. And the one thing just to add to that, anyone watching that is a business owner that's really my first advice, whether it's green and shy, super critical. I mean, Ethan has a good group with Gromentum Lab. 
Get advice from people that know what they're talking about. Don't waste your time, you know, guessing and checking because this isn't an industry where you can just throw it against the wall. It'll just get passed up. Well, especially on the funding side. I mean, honestly, you know, maybe a year ago, um, there were more deals that were happening, which I would call sort of back of the envelope deals. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, FOMO investment going on. People didn't want to miss out jumping on to, to anything that had cannabis attached to it. Um, those days, those days are over. Uh, you've got to prove yourself. You've got to have something. Valuations are coming way in line with with normal industries as opposed to these crazy valuations for for first mover advantage. Um, so yeah, there, you know it's it's difficult to find capital, but it's out there. Um, there are smart investors out there placing capital in cannabis, um, and I really feel like there is. Um, there, there's a uh, there's a swelling urge to get back into cannabis. So if you look at what's happened with cannabis, everything was riding super high, uh, and then uh, one of the big dips came with the vape crisis, right? So people start dying all over the place. Sorry, the sun is coming in like crazy over here. Um, <laughs> uh, people started dying. <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh. uh, so people start uh, start dying. Uh, is it nicotine? Is it cannabis? And so that 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 sent some shock waves. Then a lot of the publicly traded um, companies on the Canadian stock exchange start missing earnings quarter after quarter, further drying up the capital. And then uh, as we come into the, 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 the beginning of this year, you start running into COVID-19. Uh, and, and you know, oddly enough, that was of a bit of a boost to the industry, but it definitely tightened up investment dollars because people with money or, or income streams weren't really sure what the hell was going to happen. I mean, today they're not sure what mm -hmm. is going to happen. Um, we, we had an investor client who is in uh, real estate and had buildings that were going up, uh, you know, uh, residential buildings going up that were about to start to, to go to sale during COVID. And they were like, I'm pretty sure this is all going to be great, but I have no idea what the market's going to be for new condominiums right. in the midst of a pandemic. And so that, that individual will not put any capital right out until they can see past uh, the horizon. And so, you know, that's been, that's been a, it's, it's really, it really means that you really have to bring your A game when it comes to getting financing. It can't just be a good idea. It can't just be, uh, you know, some nice projections. You really have to have a thought out operational plan and you need to find strategic investors. You want smart money, not just money. Mm -hmm. uh, all the all the all the large cannabis companies uh, that are publicly traded, they all got money, not necessarily smart money. And you can see how well that turned out. Um, it's been pretty rough for those guys. It's been rough sledding. Uh, hopefully they'll come out. You know, I, I want everyone to be successful in this business, and I think there's room for everybody. Um, but there's a lot of lessons to be learned right now um, if you want to uh, to raise capital in this market. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Carrie, on the, on the capital side, you know, obviously there, there's a lot of different options for, you know, what people can, can reach out to for the funding, whether it's the investors or financing side, but it doesn't really matter unless it's done the right way. What are come a, what, what's a, what's a horror story you've seen in the past? I mean, a lot of people have picked up their game, but you know, a lot of applications are being filled out by people that might not be qualified. So what, what are some of the don'ts that you've seen that, just you even wonder why they turned it in. Oh, God. There are so many, but to begin with, I think that every entrepreneur must come to understand that his or her startup is worth whatever that founder and the investor agree that it's worth. They need to come up with like a reasonable valuation range using a bunch, several different methodologies. That's super critical. We have four different valuation methodologies that we use for startups. And second, to recognize at the very early stage that company has very little value to investors. So it needs to be very strategic and very determined and disciplined in accomplishing milestones that will help it increase its value in the eyes of investors. I would say that one of the key things that every entrepreneur needs to do is get his or her story exactly right and to know what your value proposition is and know what your roadmap is and how you're going to get there and sparky uh, he can go on for probably two hours about pitch decks so <laughs> don't be a blight on humanity and come across with a lousy <laughs> pitch deck <laughs> yeah, that that's what i call bad pitch decks i apologize uh i, I i'm a little i'm a little um 
uh, I guess, anal retentive about it. Uh, I started a presentation design company here in Chicago. So I've done my fair share of pitch decks uh, from pitching business to pitching for financing. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if here's, I'll give, you know, quick pitch deck lessons. Um, you know, number one, uh, a pitch deck's not a teleprompter. So uh, don't, don't use it as one. Uh, two, bullets are for guns, not for slides. Um, that, that's the, the, the biggest issue with presentations today is the fact that when you crack open Microsoft PowerPoint, the first thing it has is a title with bullet points. That is the absolute wrong thing to do, so don't do it. Um, just remember, people speak in sentences. People don't speak in bullet points. This is all about conveying that you're the right person to take care of somebody's money, particularly if you're a startup. Remember, people don't invest in startup ideas. They don't really invest in startup plans. They invest in the people who are behind them. Uh, we assume the business model is good if there's going to be a business. And so we're investing in you. And so the focus needs to be you, not on the numbers. I can create financial pro formas that, that come out to any sort of valuation you want. We can make numbers say anything. It's not necessarily reality. And with a startup, the, the, the numbers don't matter because you don't know what's going to happen. Neither does the investor, especially if this is something new. Let's say you've got an invention and I've come up with a new type, type of vaporizer. We don't know how that's going to perform. There's no way to know. We could do some surveys and some polling. We got an idea, but you just don't know. So they're investing in you. And if the focus is not on you, the best content, the best deck, all that in the world is never going to save you. It's just not going to save you. Um, and always tell a story. Always tell a story. That's what people want to hear. Connect with the investor, connect with the consumer. That's how you're going to win in this business. And, and I agree with that. And you know, you, you can uh, let me know your thoughts on this, but with cannabis, it's a little bit different. I feel like almost all the 40 or so current license holders that have opened dispensaries, it doesn't matter how they operate, they're making money and they're profitable. The question is how trustworthy are those operators as if I'm an investor? And I think that's a, a very good point because if you're telling a story about your business and you're, you're just putting it on numbers, they're never going to get to know you. So when they don't see you and they're running the operations, there's a lot of red tape when it comes to the cannabis dispensaries, cannabis companies, and that, that trust level, I think, I think you have to sell the people involved before the business itself, unless you have some miraculous story that makes your cannabis different, uh, pretty, pretty close product as far as the, the different lines. Yeah. Absolutely. And whenever you're assessing the value of a startup, you're going to have your company specific factors as well as macroeconomic factors that will impact that valuation. And so over the past six months, we've had significant headwinds to funding because of what happened with COVID. But we've also had political and legislative changes, regulatory changes, and the, the industry trend of going from you know prohibited to essential is going to provide a bit of a tailwind going into the next six months of the year and then on the the company specific side as you were saying like you really are at early stage you're betting on the founder so for any entrepreneurs out there that are looking to raise capital make sure that you have a very solid narrative around your experience level if you've done exits in the past if you've had successful launches of products you also want to be really locked in on your your who your customer is know your customer customer traction mm -hmm. and understand very specifically what your technology or your product solution is and what the advantages are to that Absolutely. And that'll help you move the bottle a little bit down the court and, and Carrie, you might know a little bit more about this than I do. I'm involved with some groups here. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Elevate. It's a very large uh, women leadership group owned by Elevest, a very large women uh -huh, investment fund. There's a lot of groups like that that have a, a segment or a department or a group inside their group that's focused on women in cannabis. What are some of the resources that are out there that our audience can really tap into? Because that is something that's growing. That's a movement. And I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of cool companies. I know, uh, Tulip Tree Gardens, that's a, a local, uh, I think they're out of Peoria, a local cultivator, CBD grower here. There's a lot of good companies coming out of these groups. And, you know, it'd be great to hear some of the stories you might have. I'm sure you're involved with a few of them. I am. I'm a member of the Illinois Women in Cannabis, and I'm also a member of the International Women's Forum. 
And groups like that have a lot of senior level experienced women in business in their membership and on their boards. And they're very willing to be mentors and sponsors for up and coming entrepreneurs, people that have ideas that maybe don't know how to execute on them, but are pretty locked in on what they want to accomplish. So absolutely take advantage of those networks. And then additionally, it, in Chicago and in any large city, there are organizations like the Chartered Financial Analyst Society or the CPA Society, where there are finance professionals that have mentors on staff through their membership that will help young companies figure out how they're going to get their revenue projections for the next three years or help them understand what all of the financial statements are, be it your income statement or your balance sheet, and really dive in with you so that you have a solid understanding of what those documents can do for you in terms of communicating with potential investors. Absolutely. And, and do you see a lot of cross collaboration uh, between those groups? as far as sharing resources, referring business to each other, it seems like that would be one thing to make sense because they all, it's kind of like a giant Venn diagram, you know, they all have different areas they cover and they all overlap in certain areas as well. Absolutely, so organizations like IWF, the International Women's Forum, it's not dedicated to a specific industry. So you've got everybody from consultants to attorneys, to auditors, to your, um, deal makers that are part of it. They can all help with that building out your particular ecosystem. And then you have you know, the domain knowledge specific mm -hmm. organizations like CFA Society or CPA Society where you can lock in on a particular discipline. But it's really important. And as you guys know very well, networking is essential. And you just never know how one conversation can turn your entire project around and move it in the direction you knew it was always meant to go in, but just couldn't quite figure it out. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one of the tricks that I always, uh, you know, mentioned to entrepreneurs that were getting into the business. Never told them to go apply for every type of financing and talk to every investor that, you know, that might be not the smart move, but letting everyone know about your opportunity and letting them know about your passion so that when someone reminds them of some of the keywords that you use, they think of you is the whole, is the whole point of networking, right? It's never to pitch every person you see. It's to really get them to know who you are, what you do and vice versa, because anytime you connect someone, especially before ever them doing something for you, they'll remember for you ever, you know, and then that's the whole point. And more success comes from that than you believe, whether it's getting a job or investing, and, you know, I, actually, I met Sparky at one of my events. Uh, I think, uh, what was it, the, the first panel discussion and the second one, you came there. And we had a yeah. great panel. And unfortunately, we, uh, they, they cut off all the events here, as everyone knows. And that yeah. might change in July, so stay tuned. <laughs> but even now, in the absence of networking events or in-person seminars, people are still getting funded virtually. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that more and more each day where you know, Zoom calls are the, the on-site due diligence of the past where you just ha you have to make do. And I know we've said multiple times already tonight that you're betting on the founder and the best way to get to know the founder is in person and spending time like that. But absent face-to-face uh, -face, in real life, uh, Zoom meetings are where the deals are getting done. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Sparky, with your background, you know, uh, you're really working in the marketing and, and the branding side. And there's a lot of discussion in that. And, and I, I'm bringing up your past past, but I know you're an expert in it. So I thought it'd be interesting because I feel like, and I'm an aficionado. I, you know, hunt down exotics. I like my uh, THCs and, you know, I'm more of a CBG fan than a CBD. But the thing about it is it seems like the fight is for packaging. Packaging, packaging, packaging. And really, it should be on what we're talking about, the branding, the story behind it, because I've seen some crap products and some good packaging and some good products and some crap. And unfortunately, crap ones get sold better, right? But that doesn't help them get that funding. So when they come to us or you know reach out for funding sources, they have nothing to show besides some fancy packaging. I mean, with your background, 
what do you think about that? I mean, is that really important? Are, are both of them important or neither? I mean, in the, when it comes to raising capital. So uh, when it comes to raising capital in the cannabis space, you, you really need to have a fundamental understanding of what branding is and what it's for. You may not have a fully developed brand at the time that you go raise capital, and that's okay, but you better understand what it is, why you have it, how it should incorporate into your business operations, because cannabis is inherently a CPG industry, a consumer packaged goods, and mm -hmm. there is a very specific way that you market consumer packaged goods, and there's very specific things like a shopper's path to purchase, how people react in store to in store displays, all the way back to how you make the, the product. All these things tie in together and they all have to revolve around the brand. The brand is not the logo, the brand is not the packaging. A brand, by definition, is a promise for future emotional benefit. Mm -hmm. When you buy my product or service, you're going to feel an emotional benefit. Um, although I think it's probably been usurped by Subaru these days, but if you're a little bit older like myself, back in the day, if you wanted a safe car, you bought a Volvo, period. They were synonymous with safe. And if you ever saw what an old Volvo looks like, it looks like a freaking tank because you just couldn't get the thing. And that went with the brand. The, the, the car looked like it was supposed to it looked like the safest car in the world because it looked like a tank and so understanding that a brand is a promise for future emotional, future emotional benefit and understanding that the very center you must be beyond constantly preoccupied with delighting your end consumer if you're not doing that you will lose in this game it's no longer a, if you build it they will come type of model it used to be hey it's cannabis there's only a few licensees all you gotta do is start growing weed start selling a few people are going to show up but <laughs> now that you're getting into adult use now that there's going to be more licensees and believe me after we're done with this current round of licensing um uh, that the legislation is written for so through the next year believe me there will be plenty more licenses after that there, there was nowhere near the capacity we're going to need to service the state of illinois with what we've already said we're going to do so um there, there will be tons more opportunity. And that is when you need to start making connections with your consumers. You have to have a unique value proposition to those independent consumers to say, I am giving you, I'm fulfilling this brand promise to you that nobody else can fulfill. It's why people spend, as some people would say, too much money on Apple products. I can get a much faster computer for cheaper. It's the brand and the entire brand experience, the entire ecosystem that Apple has built that brings people in and holds on to them for dear life. That is what this business is about. You need to be just fanatical about pleasing your end consumer. That's the name of the game. Absolutely, absolutely. And no, the branding is much more psychological than people think, you know, and it lasts. I know a couple of summers ago, as soon as I saw Zima and Jewel, I bought cases and that's just that branding after years gone still stuck with me and the funny example, but you know, it's something that really shows the value of things. And I, I like to say it though, uh, you know, I think the, the, the gentlemen in the industry are more about, you know, just business packaging and the, the female owned businesses or the businesses with the story are the ones that I'm seeing have some of the greatest branding and stories behind it. Uh, I know, I know quite a few, like the one I mentioned, Tulip Tree Gardens. I mean, is there a example from your side, Carrie, that you think of a company that you work with maybe that uh, you helped raise capital that really did a good job on that? There are a few and one that comes to mind I actually ended up going to do a crowdfunding to raise capital, but it's based in Oregon. It's called A Boring Life. It's a CBD infused food products company. They do a beautiful job on their branding and packaging, but they have a really good story too about how they came into bringing CBD and the food products. And both the founder and her partner had experience in another 
company where they had organic chicken nuggets and <laughs> they started that, grew it, developed it and sold it. And so having had that experience, both the operational experience, the branding and marketing experience, the distribution experience, and then having an exit on top of it that did well, really set them up perfectly to go out and raise capital for their CBD products. And eventually, having gone several rounds, I think they were at their Series A, then they say, we're going to take this out because we want to have even more people be part of our brand and our story. So when they did the crowdfunding, they were able to get about $500,000 raised through that mechanism. So a really good story, a really good feeling. And like Sparky was saying, you know, it's something that sticks with you and they've done that, managed that very successfully. Absolutely. And, you know, it's good to hear those type of stories because they are out there. If you do it the right way, this is one of those industries that if you do it the right way and don't just try to keep up with the Joneses or who else you think you're competing with, you're going to last. It's the ones that are cutting corners that are getting caught up, whether it's tax wise, which you know, it's going to be a, a bigger issue in the coming years, but it, okay. it, it's very interesting. And, you know, I think it's very important. I think that's a good point. I think it's a good point. And I think that, you know, yeah. we covered the branding side. It's important that it's a, a story, something you're passionate about. You know, you need to have the ability to show the value of it. Let's say you got all that done, right? Why don't we jump to, to Sparky's favorite topic in that pitch deck? I mean, what is if you were to wake up and I sent you, I said, Sparky, open your email. It's the pitch deck. It's the best thing. What would you expect that to look like? You know, is it, is it something like some of these that I see for uh, some of these green zone funds that are 150 pages that they expect me to send out to investors? Or is it something that that whole teaser follow up model that really gets you? So, um, first of all, I apologize. I may be slightly delayed on audio. My computer is just a little slow right now, so I apologize for any connection issues. Um, but when it comes to pitch decks, first of all, um, you should have two pitch decks. You have what's called a live pitch deck and you have a leave behind. Um, and, and, and the leave behind is also what you would use if uh, someone you can't pitch to somebody live and you've got to send them your deck. Um, you should try to avoid that at all costs, but if you have to, you have to. And so the leave behind deck has all of the information you're going to cover in your presentation. Um, the uh, live pitch deck actually is very visual, has very few words, and is there to really um, add emphasis to what you're saying as a presenter. So what people seem to not understand is a pitch deck or a presentation in general, when you're giving it live, is not meant to convey all of the information. It is meant to control what the audience remembers. This is your unique opportunity as someone who's trying to convince someone else to invest in you to control what they remember, what they take away. That is the purpose of a pitch deck. And so what I wanna see in a pitch deck, if it's a live pitch deck, is I don't wanna to see too much stuff on screen. I don't want to ever be put in a position where I'm reading ahead of the person that's speaking. My focus should be on you, the presenter, the person I'm investing in. What's on the screen is supposed to remind me what to remember. And that's how this is supposed to work. So that is how we build pitch deck. Um, and if I can just give a real quick piece of advice for those of you who are not going to be able to hire someone to create a pitch deck, it's roughly a seven step process to, to create a good deck. Uh, it doesn't have to be a pitch, be any kind of deck. The second to the last step in those seven steps is open up PowerPoint and start making your slides. And so everyone starts with that step. Everyone opens up PowerPoint and just starts typing stuff in. That is the wrong approach. You need to start with, a, with a, uh, this is the goal of my presentation. Then you're gonna start off, these are the key points I need to make in my presentation. And that can be in bullet point form. And then after that, you're going to write a script, the exact words you're gonna say. It seems really uncomfortable and weird and like extra work, but trust me, you're gonna be happy that you did it. Once you know exactly what you're going to say and when you're going to say it, then you start planning your visual guides. These are the things I wanna emphasize as I'm talking. And then the very last step before, the second to last step is, then I put all that in PowerPoint and then I rehearse the shit out of it. And then I go out and I make my presentation. So um, that's how it works. That's what they're for. 
make them clear, make them concise, and make sure you're reinforcing on the things you want them to remember and walk away with from your presentation. Absolutely. And one thing that you touched base on, you know, about the whole presentation, you don't want to be waiting for the next slide. I can't emphasize that even, uh, even more than that, because you know, when we did private equity VC summits in Dubai, people would pay for us to set these up. 15, 30, 50,000. It, it's very valuable, the service that we provided. But my point is they only got three minutes, maybe four on that stage. And if you're not using that time correctly, you're just wasting your own time. It's not their time you're wasting. They just won't be interested. And that's what people don't get. And it's not about the presentation. There's so many times when people get through that presentation because it's just line after line in two minutes. And what do you do for the next two minutes besides look dumb? And then there's also those people, especially some companies that are maybe even penny stocks or, or public companies, they go up there, announce themselves and just say it's all on the internet. I mean, these are some very big mistakes that people make. Use that time to talk about what we've been discussing, who you are, why they should invest in you, because if they're interested in that, they'll want to talk about the numbers, not the other way around, you know, in, in this industry, especially. Absolutely. Go ahead. One Sorry. other point to that is, uh, although it sounds a little trite and a little bit tired, but you really do want to be authentic. When you have those four or five minutes, that is your opportunity to make a real connection with someone else. And you don't want to misfire. So know your stuff cold. Know all your facts and figures extraordinarily well. So you don't even have to exert any effort remembering them. And then just bring all of your being there. Be present in the moment and really engage. And that's what's going to create the lasting impression. Don't be looking down at your notes and, and don't be trying to follow your slides and make sure they're in order and don't wanna be talking out of order, all of that. It's just a real turn off and you, you, you have such little time to make a solid impression and a strong connection. Very good point, very good point. I'm gonna bounce it right back to you, Carrie, on another topic. What's out there for our cannabis people? What kind of funding is actually out there. I mean, you hear people in the news, some of the big companies that we talked about that have access to everything getting funding left and right. What can our people, our audience, the little guys and gals, what can they do to get the funding and succeed? Because that's what's important to me. I mean, it really is, especially here in Chicago, we have what, uh, 7,000 applications for 75 licenses, something like that, some ridiculous number, which they are going to start announcing some of those delayed social equity applications. I heard that lawyer, uh, or Lightfoot, or not Lori, uh, Toy Hutchinson uh, announced, mm -hmm. but it's some, some good movement. But, you know, what, what are some of the tools? I mean, obviously, there's different needs. You know, some people need the investor for the application and license. Some people need real estate. W what's actually working for people out there, Carrie? So these days, we're seeing more interest in debt financing than equity financing. So especially convertible debt or notes. Mm -hmm. And we're also seeing that come from private investors. So private credit providers, as opposed to banks or getting a traditional bank loan because we still have such severe regulations against the banking for cannabis. And then in addition to that, you're going to wanna to focus more on the groups like impact investing or angel investors where they have a specific uh, preference for social equity investing. And that's where you're going to find money that's more readily available today. And also what's come up over the, especially over the past six months are what we call SPACs, which are the special purpose acquisition companies. There have been a number of those coming through it with cannabis so that they will have a significant amount of money to deploy. They have up to 24 months to make the investment in cannabis companies. But that's a way for people to get some money back into their startups. Absolutely. And, and Sparky, do you have any... Uh other things that you can add to that or pretty much those same resources? Um, yeah, I mean, from, from a resource perspective, I would say uh, they're all pretty similar. Um, you know, kind of piggybacking on some of the other things we talked about, um, you know, just remember that, you know, in cannabis right now, a lot of business plans look the same. 
you know, particularly let's say in Illinois right now, uh, I've applied for a craft grow license and this is how much money I'm going to make on my 5,000 square feet of canopy. And here's, you know, where it's going to be and here's who owns it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot, there's not a lot of diversity in the, the, the plans that you see. Cultivation is generally speaking cultivation. Manufacturing is generally speaking manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So trying to create a unique, uh, uh, a, unique, a unique value proposition can be very difficult. Um, and if you don't have consultants to work with to really try to come up with a way to differentiate you or express to a potential investor why you specifically are going to be successful, what Carrie said, authenticity makes up for a lot of shortcomings in a plan or a deck. So, you know, and, and one of the things that's super critical, we get questions from um, companies and from, uh, we, we work with other people who do what we do. So other sort of uh, capital um, capital raisers, and, and sometimes we'll work uh, together on various deals. Um, and, you know, when we're, when we're talking to those people and trying to understand, um, how, boy, I just lost my train of thought real quickly. Wow. We're talking about money. Yes, I know. I will. I'm always talking about money. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was going to make a point about, oh, so yeah, uh, you know, the authenticity comes through and uh, it makes up for a lot of deficiencies um, that you may have in, in your plan and, and it can get you across the finish line. Um, I probably have another thought to go with that and I've just lost it. If it comes back, I'm, I'm sure I'll, I'll chime in. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, one thing I, I would say, and it's it, just like any company, just like your brand is kind of the foundation of your products and services and why people, I mean, you had amazing quote that I'm going to probably use and I, I'll give you credit for, you know, that whole promise for future, future emotional benefit. That's what, you know, branding is. I, I really like that. And you know, there, there's a standpoint, you know, that's the foundation of your product. The foundation of your, your financing is really the core, you know, do you have a, a bank that's, understanding what you're doing a lot of companies even if it's cbd i mean it's nationwide it's legal people don't understand the reasons why the banks still don't like to work with that and it's the charge bags it's the the, the behind the scenes and everything that's a big issue with the cannabis side so you know my my big advice is find someone and you know any one of us could help you with that or there's a number of people but find someone that's not just a cbd friendly bank they'll limit your options someone that's cannabis friendly and there are some that you know work across that and on the next level really try just like any type of financing to show and have a consistent basis of what your actual cash flows are. I mean, there's two different kind of stories that I think we're talking about, right? The startup, the, the people that are waiting for their license, hoping that they're going to have a great business and the people that are in it, they need that secondary, third, tri-cherry or whatever, you know, level of funding. And, you know, there are two different avenues, but there is different ways. Even if you're a, a full cash you know, uh, dispensary or what have you. you, know, there are options for, you know, debt processing, even credit card processing like True Harbor does that we work with. Um, but there's a lot of different options that come from that. I know back in the, the real estate crash, we weren't able to get construction loans, but if we can serve a debt service of, you know, 1.2, we can get them bridge financing, which does the same thing, which there are a lot of companies that will you just have to be in the cannabis industry realizing that it's usually six to 24 month terms. They're very short. Yeah, you, you make a really good point there. It's never too soon to start developing a banking relationship. Even for super critical, we're non-plant touching. We went to 20 something, how many spark at least oh, to try and get the, the yeah, bank it, it, it took us It took us six weeks to get a bank account. It was painful. It was expensive. Um, and like Carrie said, we're not plant touching. So when it comes to plant touching, it's, it's even worse. Uh, banking is very expensive. It is difficult to come by. You can get it, but uh, it's challenging. Um, yeah, super and, frustrating. Uh, it, it is crazy frustrating. Um, so yeah, start, start that today. If I, yeah, you want to know, maybe you're not licensed yet. You haven't got a license, uh, but you think you're, you're feeling really strong. Uh, come mid July slash early September or late late August when they put up these uh, seventy five dispensary licenses, start start getting your banking affairs in order right now. Uh, mm -hmm. Make sure you've identified a bank that banks cannabis. Make sure they know who you are, uh, because when those seventy five licenses come out, uh, not only uh, are you going to have a bunch of people looking for banking all at the same time, um, you know these banks 
the, the reason the cost of a bank account is so much in the cannabis space is that there is a bunch of reporting that has to be done to meet uh, fin with FinCEN requirements. And so they have to put in a lot of man hours and, and they don't have a bunch of yeah. people to kind of do all this crazy reporting. And so it is a, it's a finite resource. So uh, definitely get your banking affairs in order or get it, you know, know where you're going to go. Make sure you've had a discussion with them. Don't start paying the fees until you absolutely have to because they're brutal. Um, but yeah, be ready. Be ready to set it with your banking. It's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Absolutely. But I mean, that's a big step. I know options that we work with for financing for some of our clients. If you have a bank account, you're generating cash revenues. There's options for funding that you don't have to give up equity. And that's a big thing right now because there's investors out there that know the value of their dollar and know that people don't know how to get cannabis funding and they're buying up companies uh, small that grow up into something big just because of demand easily, you know? So there, there's a lot of options out there if you set it up smart. And, you know, that's why it's important to, to ask someone, you know, this isn't an industry that is really, you know, too competitive about not wanting others in. There's not that many, you know, well, besides the application and, the, and the, the obvious, there isn't that many barriers to entry. Everyone wants to help each other out. So definitely ask a lot of, a lot of questions and ask for help. You know, there's people like Sparky and, and Carrie out there that are always helping and they have the experience, you know, just like Green and Shy, we do a variety of things. There's a number of different groups out there. And, you know, we have a couple questions here. It's, wow, 50 minutes already went by real quickly. I have one that's specific <laughs> The financing, a uh, little indirect, but let's see if we can get some answers to it. It's basically, uh, uh, you know, asking about uh, funding here. What type of ROI for six million dollar loan are you seeing in industry? I mean, would this would be for a, a cultivation with roughly eighty eight thousand square feet of greenhouse canopy, not including nursery? I mean, just uh, an, as an idea. I I, I have a million questions. Send me an email, sparky at supercritical.agency. <laughs> I will ask you about a dozen questions and I'll be happy to give you an answer. Uh, that, that's far too broad. I mean, that's just, that's out there. Um, but yeah, s send us an email. I'm happy to, to give you an idea of, of what's, and, what's and going on And that's something that, you know, I'd like to jump into that conversation too. Obviously it's uh, probably could uh, have this whole hour about just that opportunity if we really want to dig into it. But there <laughs> yeah. are options out there. There are. Yeah, I mean, it's, are. it's a little bit different. And that sounds like you guys know what you're talking about. You have some some good numbers there. I mean, you're looking into it. So uh, email Spark here or myself, and we'll be able to set up a call and go into that directly. But, you know, these are some good things that you need to find out because there's going to be a variety of terms to depending on who you talk to, you know, we have low teens in some products and some people have 22% for the same product, you know, yeah, it's I would say really different out there. What was that? Mid teens, I would say, I mean, if you, if you have money to lend, it's a really good market. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely. And you know, with that, I always like, and, and I wish Dan was here, uh, my counterpart that's always on the fireside chat. It's actually his lady's birthday today. So we say happy birthday to Cindy as well. Happy birthday. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I really, uh, he started it off. I really like what he does, you know, ending on a thought that you have. I mean, uh, ladies first, Carrie, but what, what's one thing if you were to share? I mean, it could be anything about the capital banking, cannabis industry. Uh, it could be towards the women leaders out there. It could be towards everybody. What's your big thing that you'd like to say <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was don't be a dick because <laughs> <laughs> i i back that a thousand percent <laughs> that's really my my words of wisdom tonight you just it's a pretty insular industry a lot of people know each other um personal referrals go a long way and you just don't know who knows someone that you've just been a dick to. So just, you know, <laughs> know your stuff and be cool. And that tends to, being a dick spreads faster than being nice. I'll tell you that much. Definitely. <laughs> um, I guess for me, what I would say is, uh, you know, we, we say this super, super critical a lot, uh, do this for the right reasons. Uh, if you're just doing this for the money, you're not in it for the right reasons. Uh, you can do that and you can probably make money, but there's so much history uh, about this plant. 
about what people have done to allow us to have access to this plant. Uh, respect the plant, do this for the right reasons, be passionate about what you do. The money will happen, man. You're gonna make plenty of money in this business. Um, and it's really not that hard. You just gotta be authentic, be true to yourself. And again, do it for the right reasons, it'll come to you. It's when you try to maximize profits, it's when you take a, a really hard edge look to this that it falls apart because when, if you've ever been to California, Northern California, Humboldt County, where a, a lot of the best cannabis in this country has ever been grown, and you see the people who've done this for 30, 40 years, for generations, and you realize how much they care about what they do and how much they care about the craft of this plant, you, you, you understand that it's more, that it's more than the money. There, there is so much culture and history behind this that you have to respect and bring with you as we bring it from California, you know, across these 50 states. Um, I just think you're going to be far more happy. You're going to have a hell of a lot of fun and you're going to make a shit ton of money if you just do it for the right reason. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I a hundred percent agree with that because, you know, this industry, it, it's something very interesting because part of the country is way ahead, but they're still developing. There's still things that they don't know. Some of us are just beginning and we don't even know what's coming to the forefront of what to expect. But at the same time, there's that same level of passion. And you have these conversations with people that are in this industry. You can tell the people that Sparky's talking about, that Carrie's talking about, that I'm talking about, that have that brand and the message. Because when you talk to them, you're not talking about one thing. You tend to talk about their business. And that same business, you're talking about it as a conversation as if it was a business with financing, but also an art. Because if they're passionate about it, they have some sort of, uh, in the niche about their product, whether it's something unique about it, or if they're a cultivator, how impressive they are with a certain strain that they've worked years to cultivate, or maybe it is something that they have been able to cure, whether it's a, in a cream forest and it, and it helps something with pain, or maybe someone with PTSD, like a lot of the products help our, our nation's vets and everything else out there that's going on, especially now with all the stress. And you can't have that. There's not a single product in any other industry where you can talk about business, you talk about it as if it's a food or an art or a craft, all in the same conversation. And you know that's what really takes to, to really be passionate about something, knowing it in and out. And you know, just like when I spoke with you, Sparky, the first time, first thing that you said is that you went to jail for it, you're out, and we just started talking, and it was just an interesting story. You can't talk about it, anything like that in any industry, you know, you were in the real estate. I, yeah, I just got out of jail, did three years now. I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to talk to you, right? <laughs> what kind of Ponzi scheme were you in? But now it, 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 it's a whole different story. And I'm sure you have thoughts because, you know, if the times were different, you probably wouldn't have had to spend that three years. But it, it's definitely an experience that make you kind of a little bit above as far as that, uh, that, that storytelling. And it, it, it took a while for the conviction to be of value. I just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Early on, it wasn't quite as valuable as it is today. Um, but yeah, no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Sparky has the best stories. <laughs> well, next I got a couple. Sparky it will was host amazing. his own fireside chat. Stories the whole hour. Stor no, stories like, of Sparky. Some we're crazy start, shit he uh, did <laughs> in the beginnings of the cannabis industry. Well, uh, before we wrap up here, it's been a, a great hour. I really feel like, uh, you know, these conversations and they feel like they're 10, 15 minutes long, but they're an hour and you know, we run out of time. Uh, they're some of the best ones. And I think there's a lot of good tools, whether it's being passionate about the branding and really thinking about the message or, you know, really making sure that the pitch deck is, you know, set up for the actual purpose to gather the information as well as present and really tell the story so they captivate and want that additional information for the, the follow-up pitch deck as well. But really, you know, to get out of this, it, it, it takes a lot more than just having an idea, you know, and, and it's great people like Sparky and Carrie that are helping people out there that, that want to be an entrepreneur in this industry or want to get the help or even learn how to, you know, be a part of it. Why don't you guys both tell everyone how they can get a hold of you guys? We're going to share all of this as far as their links as well when we post the recording. Um, and you know, feel free to share anything else you guys want before we end here. Yeah, check us Sorry. out on Twitter at Supercritical. Check out our website, supercritical.agency. Uh, drop us a note at 
Kerry at Supercritical or Sparky at Supercritical. And we also want to just say hey to our other partner, Jay Cowley, who couldn't be with us tonight, but uh, Jay's just an amazing human being and someone that just we love working with too. So he's Jay at Supercritical.agency. Absolutely. And uh, I'll say thank you, uh, Alton, uh, Tony, Dan, and Green and Shy for having us on. Uh, really appreciate it. We had a great time. Uh, happy to come back again, you know, if anyone wants to shoot the shit about cannabis. Uh, it's what I do. I love bringing people into this industry. Um, so, yeah, if, if you have funding needs, uh, you want some friendly advice, you know, uh, go ahead, shoot us an email. Uh, and if we can point you in the right direction, we'll be happy to help. Absolutely. And once again, thank you guys and gal for thank joining you. us. Uh, if you guys need anybody in the cannabis industry, contest us at uh, Green and Shy. You know, we'll help you with your sales. We'll point you in the right direction as far as banking. We work with a variety of different options. We know people in the cannabis industry, whether it's legal, real estate, or advice like these great people right here. Contact us because there is a path to succeed. And it's not going to be by yourself. It's going to be with others. Once you realize that, it's much easier to work together. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Have a great night. Ciao for now. Bye.